thanks for joining. I'm glad that you guys all had interest in the Certified Trainers Network. And so what we're gonna do this morning is I'm gonna run through a long PowerPoint and we'll have a couple of breaks where we'll introduce ourselves, talk to each other, and share some information. Um, so some of these slides do have a lot of words on them. Don't be afraid that you have to jot down notes or anything like that. I will be sharing the PowerPoint with you, which is why there is so much info on each of the slides so that when you get the PowerPoint afterwards, you'll have enough information that'll help you host trainings and remember what you need to do or what you want to do. We'll kind of stop and give you guys an opportunity to share with each other your interests in IMAP invasives and just share some information about some trainings that you have planned or if you want to plan trainings. I'm actually doing this training as part of my master's project. And so to get into that a little bit more, my name is Brittany Rogers. I actually got my degree in zoology from SUNY Oswego. And right after graduation, I started working for New York Sea Grant and have been with Sea Grant ever since. And so I have been I'm working with watercraft inspection programs around the state, initially running the watercraft inspection program that New York Sea Grant had, and now more focused on standardizing training and programs across the state, as we have so many programs around the state. I do some wildlife rehabilitation volunteer work in my spare time, and I've had the opportunity to do so many different things over the past few years. And all of that kind of led me to where I am now, which is a graduate student at SUNY ESF. And so this IMAP Invasive Certified Trainers Network is part of um, what my research is and my, my main project for school. And so what I'm doing is actually creating this trainers network and working with those of you who are on the line who are interested in hosting trainings. So working with everybody to kind of create this network around the state to get more opportunity for IMAP Invasives trainings to be hosted around the state and to also get more coverage. And there's some gaps in areas that the small IMAP team can't necessarily get to all the time. So the next step, I guess I wanna know is, and everyone else, I hope that everyone, I see a couple of you have already started, just share a little bit of information about yourself in the chat box. And I'll just give everyone a minute to do that. Great, thanks everybody for joining and sharing a little bit about yourselves this morning. So for those of you who are looking in the chat box, you can see we have a variety of people. So we have someone from Western New York. We have the Hudson. Syracuse is covered in Central New York pretty well. Um, we have Cornell. Old Westbury down on Long Island. Geneva. So we kind of have this whole range covered pretty well. Um, it looks like we also have some people from Albany, I'm guessing. Oh, we also have the cat skills covered. That's great. Um, yeah, so we have a big variety of people from all over the state. And so part of what this network is, is to not only expand the coverage of trainings around the state. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go over the objectives of what my plan is for this morning and um, kind of get right into it. And so this won't be an actual IMAP Invasives training, I know there are a few of you who didn't have usernames that I had to create usernames for you, but the overview that you'll get should be sufficient, more than sufficient enough for you to be able to um, be more familiar with IMAP Invasives. And I hope that each and every one of you, if you are interested in moving forward with IMAP Invasives, you'll also take the time to get into the program and kind of look through our website and look through the information and resources that are available to you. So again, so my objectives of this training is to certify each and every one of you to help increase the knowledge and understanding of invasive species and their distribution and impacts around New York State. There are IMAP invasives programs around the state, not just here in New York, but we'll get back into that. Um, so we're going to go through the basics of what hosting a training is, what you would have to do to do it and then kind of go through your steps before, during, and after. And then towards the end of today's training, we'll get into um, a certification plan, I call it. So kind of just walking through and just trying to help you guys guide each, and guide each of you towards planning your first trainings and then also going through the next steps in the evaluation. So I'm going to give you all a second. Um, so for those of you who have used it or haven't used it, um, just kind of share in the chat box what IMAP Invasives is 
what your general definition would be. Great, so a couple of you also shared to me privately. You guys all are right on track, so it's just a great way to share invasive species information. It's a sourcing tool, it's a platform for reporting, so you guys all have a pretty good grasp on what the definition is. And so my definition that I typically tend to use is just a, it's a collaborative GIS-based online tool for invasive species management. So quick and easy, it doesn't have to be too in depth, but I will share more information with all of you about um, a little bit more in depth about what IMAP Invasives is, where the history came from, and how it came about in New York State especially. When you host a training, depending on your audience, you're going to have to customize each of them. So you can't host the same training for every single individual. It needs to be changed up a little bit depending on what they're interested in, if there's a particular species that people are interested in using IMAP invasives for, or if there's a certain location that they're interested in mapping. So you'll have to kind of know a little bit about the invasive species in that region, or if they're just generally interested in the larger cause of things, um, adding a field component. And so I just want everyone to take a couple minutes to kind of answer some of these questions. And kind of get a general audience in mind and then just answer some of the questions, what your goals are, if you'll be able to include a field component, if you'll be able to bring a specimen in for ID or go out into the field and do ID, so things like that. So I'm going to give everyone a couple minutes to go forward with that. Great. So I'm seeing some interesting ways that people are going to or hope to use IMAP Invasive. So we have the target audience being K through 12 students, um, boat stewards in New York State Park staff. Um, so then we have some, which I found was interesting, a golf course target as the as the audience, which is pretty pretty cool. That's an interesting twist to it. It's kind of reaching out to new stakeholders. Um, from my perspective, I don't typically work with golf courses. Um, so then some other strike teams, some just definitely a variety in the audiences that we are going to be reaching, which is great. And so that's a big part of what this program is, is kind of reaching those new audiences. And so I know that there are different different audiences have different knowledge and understanding of things. And so that's why it's so important to customize your training. So some of your landscapers might be familiar with invasive species as there's regulations on selling invasive species plants. Um, but then also some of your golf course at attendees or even the administrators for golf courses might, have, might not have any knowledge, prior knowledge of invasive species. So then you would really wanna make sure that they know what they're looking for or even what's on their property. So that's great. So we'll kind of get into this a little bit more as we move forward towards the end of the training as we talk about your certification plan. So just keep all of that in mind and you should have access to scroll up through the chat to look back at your responses as we go through. So now that you're all prepared to customize your training, um, I'm going to go over what the basics of hosting an IMAP and basis session are. And so it's a pretty simple thing to do. So you just have to schedule your program with the interested group or decide when you want to host a program and start reaching out to different groups. You don't have to necessarily have your audience in mind before you plan it. You want to decide what training is best. So the format, so whether you want to have it as strictly mobile, online, hands-on, different things like that. Um, you want to contact the IMAP Invasives team to let them know that you're going to host the training. And as long as, as far in advance as you can, collect a pre-registration and then submit that information to the IMAP Invasives team. And so the email addresses are down here below. So there's my email address right here, and then also the general IMAP Invasives email address. And so if you are planning to host your training, um, we just ask that um, even if you just have a couple questions about things, just put the IMAP Trainers Network into the subject line. It'll help us sort out through all the other different emails just to make sure that we can get usernames created in advance. And so by me collecting registration, 
And for those of you who didn't have a username prior to this, you do now have a username, so you'll be able to get into the database. Um, so then you want to make sure that you're downloading and printing the appropriate training materials and resources that you want to hand out. And then also um, practicing with the website and the resources that you're going to use to present different things like that using your smartphones or GPS units. Go to the area if you can in advance to figure out where some species are so that you can, if you are going to include that field component, you can get out there and know where the species are and take people to that to submit their test observations. And then once you're finished with your training, we just ask that you send us a final list of the people who did attend. Um, you can do that by reconciling your sign-in sheet at the beginning of your training and then just kind of let us know how this went if people came up with questions or anything like that that you couldn't answer if you work with the team they can help you um, send a follow-up to respond to some of those people and not all of this stuff has to be done in this order again you can customize it to or tailor it to your own needs for the training format so there's so many different ways that you can do this in some places that you host a training, you might not have any internet access at all. And so you might just run through a PowerPoint and screenshots of the website so that people can see where the information is and you can kind of walk them through that way. Or you won't have a way to present on the screen at all, but you do have internet access and you can get everyone downloaded and using the app if you want to do it mobile. Um, I know that there's some organizations who aren't necessarily tech savvy, so you might need some extra people to help you walk through the audience to get people to download the app and get signed in. Or you'll have a group of students who know how to work a smartphone or something better than you, so you can just have them all download the app and get right out into the field and start looking for and identifying and reporting invasive species. So there's so many different formats of the training, and so this is really um, we'll kind of walk through it a little bit more later on as well. So there's just so many different ways that you can do this and just making it the most efficient for your program. So now you're thinking, okay, so there's so many different formats, you know, that kind of sounds like a lot of stuff for me to do. Well, don't be afraid because there's going to be so many resources available to you to make this easier for you to host the training. So really you just need to get the audience and get them into the room and kind of work with them from there. So if you have questions, the IMAP Invasives team is definitely the best resource for you to help answer some of those questions. Or part of this network is kind of creating that connection between everybody around the state. So you can always reach out to others in the network if you know, see if they had any troubles with something or suggestions for other stuff. Um, so if you're having issues with the mobile app or the website, again, you can reach out to these different um, user organizations, whether it's the network or the general team, and say you need some resources. So you want to host a training. You can download these registration sheets, PowerPoint templates, the handouts, different guides and activities, and you can download all of that stuff so you don't have to recreate it. There's no reason to recreate the wheel here. Everybody is trying to work together, so why not just make our lives easier? And I did have somebody ask that if they created their own PowerPoint for a specialized training that they want to host, then can they share that with us so that we could upload that to the resources? And the answer to that is absolutely. Um, and so if you want to add a slide to your PowerPoint that just says, you know, credit to so-and-so for creating this PowerPoint or your organization for creating this PowerPoint, that's great. And we can upload that into the resources so that if you do create that, that other people can use it as well. And so the PowerPoint templates that you'll get from, from me or from IMAP Invasives, you'll be able to tailor those to your own personal needs and for your personal programs that you're hosting. Another great resource other than the, each other and this team and this, the network that we're creating is the actual website. So this is a screenshot of the New York IMAP Invasives.org website. And so there's all sorts of information on there. Once you log in, You'll also have a resources section with even more resources available to you. And so something that we will do is have this resources section so you see the Certified Trainers Network. This is going to be your go-to page for information that we'll be uploading for this network primarily. And if there's anything else that you find that you need that you don't necessarily have the time to create, 
reach out to us via email or to the network and see if someone else has that and maybe it's already out there so you don't have to spend that extra time trying to recreate something. Pre-training tasks. So there's not too much that you need to do in advance, but there are a few steps that we do ask of you to kind of prepare for your training. And so once you have your date, time, location, all of that set, you can advertise it. We can also advertise it on the IMAP Invasives website. And then one of the things that is really helpful to us and to your audience is if you collect a pre-registration, if possible. Um, I know that I'm going to a conference next week and presenting on IMAP Invasives, and collecting a pre-registration for that is not possible. So I know that it's not always going to be something that you can do, but it's helpful if you can, because then when your audience gets there and you go through your training, you can show them their usernames and their passwords and kind of help them get signed in, edit their profiles, and get things moving. So... Um, another thing that we'll have is that registration sheet that I mentioned, and so that is to collect the information on who is actually there and present at your training, and so that way we're not just having people with usernames who haven't actually received the training. And so something that um, we're interested in doing is including a um, little section for if people are interested in becoming trainers, so then this will give them the opportunity to also join the trainers network and be able to host IMAP Invasives trainings in the future. Um, you'll be able to print off those handouts, download the PowerPoint files and the templates and kind of edit those, and then also some of the different handouts um, in advance. And then a couple days in advance, what we always do is try to send that event reminder or um, something to saying, hey, like, don't forget that you re registered for this. Just kind of that extra little push to get people up there. And so the dates that I, I mentioned, you know, it's all tentative. It doesn't have to be done exactly 14 days in advance. It can be tailored to your training and kind of moved around on a program basis. So then some of the information that you will have available to you is just these are just some screenshots of the handouts. And so there's the general IMAP and basis overview the instructions on how to submit observations, how to use the mobile app and get that all set up, but then also the Certified Trainers Network, which is, I'm hopeful that all of you got, to, got a chance to see that as well. So then on your training day, it's not too crazy. You just have to get everything set up, collect your attendance, provide the training that you've planned and worked for, um, answer questions, and if you can't answer questions, it's okay to say, I don't know the answer to that. I can get back to you on that, or I can have IMAP and Basis get back to you on that. And then you can come to us, let us know, and if there's issues, we can create some type of frequently asked question sheets or different resources for the network to use so that if someone else gets those questions, they can also answer them. And then just another thing that's really important with these trainings is that you're accepting feedback and evaluations from your audience so that A, you can help improve your future trainings, but then also you can help IMAP Invasives improve their, um, our website, mobile app, or our, help train our trainers to have those kind of answers that people are really looking for. Kind of switch gears from here. So what I'm gonna do is kind of walk through a step-by-step -step training overview. And so if I host a training, this is the steps that I would go through. And I hope that if you're hosting a training, these would be the steps you would go through as well. Especially if you're in person, being able to do a presentation before going out into the field. And the field component is a really important aspect, but it's not something that is necessarily easy to mock over a webinar. Okay, so your objectives of hosting a training for the citizen scientists or educators or volunteers or whoever they may be is to help people who are concerned with invasive species learn how to report them into the New York State database or IMAP Invasive database and give them the opportunity to help the natural resource managers. I know many of you are the people who actually do get your boots on the ground and are out there managing the invasive species, working with invasive species, working with other organizations who do this. And so it's really helpful all around to be able to have all of this information in one single database. So you're giving the citizens an opportunity to be a first detector. So they can, if they're out in their yard walking their dog, they can report new sightings of invasive species that they see. 
So they're out re reporting new invasive species that they see on their property or within their towns or communities where they work, play, and recreate. Um, also, you can give them the opportunity to help the natural resource professionals. I mentioned that a little bit, but it helps improve the distribution maps and the understanding of where species are moving to and from. And then also giving them an opportunity to search the database to find out. Uh, I know a lot of homeowners are concerned about giant hogweed. And so that's something that they can learn about, you know, if it's how close it is to their property, where it's located. And I know that also the hemlock will be is a big thing of concern right now. And so this gives people an opportunity to really get a good understanding of its spread and where it is. So now, I know I mentioned the um, just general definition and a lot of you guys submitted into the chat box what IMAP Invasives is. So it's just that collaborative GIS based online tool for invasive species management. And so a little bit of background on IMAP Invasives, it is through the New York Natural Heritage Program, a partnership through DEC and ESF. And it was actually created through the Natural Heritage Programs of Florida and New York in 2007. And currently there are nine states and one Canadian province that are using IMAP invasives to monitor invasive species and collect observations around their regions. Um, some good resources for you are online on the IMAP Invasives website, but then also if you are a close border to Pennsylvania or a close border to, say, Vermont, those are two states that if you are over there, you could probably look for invasive species. I know I've, I've been to Pennsylvania for some trainings before, and I actually have a username through Pennsylvania but you will have to take new trainings or just contact them and let them know that you're using New York IMAP invasives frequently and you can work with them other states easily enough to be able to get signed in and using IMAP invasives in other states as well. So getting people logged in. So it's pretty simple. They just go to the New York IMAP invasives.org website. You just click on login now and they will get in with their username and password. And so usernames are always the first three letters of the first name and then the full last name. Occasionally there are times where people have um, similar names with each other, so we will have to add a number or something else to the end, which you will be notified and we'll make sure that you know as a trainer or that the audience member knows that their username has extra characters to fit IMAP invasives. And so when people are signing in, I know many of you who have used IMAP Invasives have seen this. There's just some legal terms that appear and basically just instruct them to read through that quickly. Um, it's basically saying that the data, it's just kind of talking about what the data is and that how it can be used and then get people signed in. And what we do, so this, it says change me 2017. So when we create new usernames, it's always going to be change me and then whatever the year is. So for those of you who didn't have a username before this or haven't logged into IMAP Invasives before, your password is going to be change me 2018. And so I know most of you did have usernames, so that's great. Um, and then once you're, when you're hosting a training, if you're actually having people on computers or on smartphones or something, just usually kind of guide them into the section on the website for my personal information and show them how to actually change their password and so that they can customize their password to something for themselves. And that way no one else has their password either. And again, so creating these usernames aren't, it's not, it's not quick on the IMAP Invasives team and it's not something that's super easy. It just takes a little while for us to do it, especially if you have classes of 25 or 30 people um, so that's why collecting that registration in advance is really important for us on our end. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, each of the different sections within the website through this PowerPoint template and then we'll get onto the website quickly and just kind of walk through the different sections that are really important to highlight to your audiences. And so the navigation tabs up here at the top that you can see, they vary depending on the user level. So most people who are just joining IMAP Invasives will only be able to see this My IMAP Invasives tab and then also this Resources tab. And so just you can get a little bit more depending on your user level.
The My IMAP Invasives tab has four major components. So these are the most commonly used features. And so you have your enter data, your way to view the map, view observation tables, and viewing a query observations. And so you can kind of get in and search for different things. And so I'll walk a little bit more in depth with each of that. And so these are just up here on the homepage so that you can have the opportunity to see those, get to those easily so you don't have to look for that information. And I, I assume that most of you who have used IMAP invasives are familiar with these commonly used features because that's typically what you go to first. Okay, so this is your my personal information tab. So if you scroll down on the website, this is a little bit lower. And so this is where you're able to edit your profile, change your password, or manage email alerts. And so what I do want to say to all of you on the line right now, if you can, after this webinar, you will have a little bit of extra time. We won't take the full two hours. But if you can get onto your IMAP Invasives profile and edit it to make sure that it includes your organization and your location and some just some different information for us. And it's really important when we're looking back into the information from our users and especially our trainers when I'm looking back that your profiles have been updated so that it includes the most um, the most information that you can. And so then again that change my password to make sure that your audience is changing their passwords when they are first getting new usernames but then also talking about the email alerts. So I don't know if any of you on the line are getting email alerts currently about your region but and if you're not aware with this you can also do this yourself. And so this gives you the opportunity to sign up to get alerts for invasive species being reported in your area. And so I just wanna give um, a really good example of this. And so what this does is you can sign up for a specific species being reported in your area, if it's a new species or not, and then you'll get an email alert saying, oh, this was reported. And so the example that I wanna talk about is that somebody actually reported to IMAP Invasives that there was HWA in a new area on Lake Ontario. And so this sent out an email alert to people in that region and there had been no HWA there in the past, kind of caused a little bit of panic. There was some photos added with the observation and you couldn't really tell if it was HWA or not. And so they actually then in response to that, because they couldn't correctly identify it if it was or not. So then what they did is they actually went out to the field looked for HWA and went to that location where it was reported and realized that it was an incorrect report, but you couldn't really tell in the images. And so that's why when you are uploading observations, it's really important to take those great photos so you can get up close with it, um, submit those with your observation. But then also, you know, that just goes to show that within a couple of days of this report, somebody was already out there in the field looking for this invasive species. And so I know some of you might not necessarily use these email alerts yet, but it's just a really good way for you to find out. Um, I know we had some state parks or some different campuses that are here, and you can find out if new species are being reported on your campus, and you can check those out, or there'll be email alerts sent to other people. So just kind of my little blurb about email alerts and why they're important. Okay, so then the next thing is downloading my IMAP Invasives data. And so you can download your own data that you've submitted to the system. And so you can download it. So this example right here is just a general um, like Excel file that you download. So you just kind of select how you want to download it and you can just download it right to your computer and look at what you've recorded. Or if you are running a project or an organization, you can also download that data but you cannot download all of the data for all of IMAP invasives. And so the reason why we have this set up is that there are some organizations that are doing it for their work or for grants or for specific things. And so we just don't allow that data to be available to everybody around the whole state to use. And so if there's a certain project that you're working on or there's a reason that you need the data for certain regions, um, definitely reach out to the IMAP Invasives team, and you can kind of contact them and discuss with them, and they can decide if you'll be able to get the data or not. So this is just something to keep in mind if you have a project or different things that you want to work on, how you want to manage the reports. 
Okay, so now we'll move over to the resources tab. And so I know that I had mentioned on the New York IMAP Invasives and the IMAP Invasives Network sites that there are so many resources that are available. Once you get signed in, there's even more available to you. So you have the direct link to the YouTube channel, to the Facebook page, and then also handouts that you can print off and um, field forms, depending on what level user you are, you have your observation or assessment field forms that you can download and use. And so this, again, this is something else that changes depending on your user level, what you can see and what you can download. Okay, so entering data. So there's two major ways that you can enter data. There's online, and that's what the directions here are for, is the online using the desktop computer or using your mobile phone. And so they are both compatible with each other. So you upload your data through your mobile phone. As soon as you send that into the database, you can view that on a website. It's immediate response. But you can't necessarily, using your cell phone, getting onto IMAP invasives, you can use that, but it's just not as friendly. So the online version was definitely designed to be used with a computer. And so keep that in mind when you're doing your training, if your audience is going to be submitting observations from their phone or from their computer. And so they are compatible with each other, but it's definitely just you, like use a desktop or a laptop or something with a larger screen for the website or online submissions and then using a smartphone or a tablet or something for your mobile submissions. So simple, seven simple steps. They just need to get the photos that they want to submit and upload with their observation. Um, hold on one second, I apologize. My dog wants to play this morning. <laughs> All right, so anyways, so you have your photos and then you want to select who the observer was, if it was another registered user or if it was yourself. And then if it's for a project, you can select what project it's for to get that connection and then also your species type. Uh, most people typically use the common name, but a lot of the professionals, especially those of us who are more familiar with scientific names, you can do it through that as well. You can select the dates that it was um, reported or observed. And so this is so that if you're out in the field for two weeks, you can take that field form, fill that field form out, and then when you come back to the computer, you can kind of bulk upload, but then you can select what dates that you're submitting your observation for. And then it gives you the opportunity to use GPS coordinates or point on a map. So you can kind of zoom in and select where your observation was seen. And then um, you can just review it and submit it. And so when you submit it, you'll get a ID number that you can keep and immediately go into the table or the map and search for that observation and make sure that it has been uploaded successfully. And so it's kind of that real time, as soon as you hit submit, it goes into the system. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with IMAP invasives necessarily, when you submit new data, it goes into the system as unconfirmed. And so when we get to the map, I'll show you a little bit more about that. And so what someone does is goes back into the system and confirms the observation. So that HWA that I had mentioned before, that was um, unfortunately misidentified, or fortunately misidentified, in the new region, so that was an unconfirmed piece of data. And so what you do is you go back into the system, look at it, figure out if it is, and you can either we can confirm or deny what it is. So just to keep that in mind, so that if people aren't positive what it is and they just think that is the plant or the animal that they're looking at, um, you know, there's that, that secondary check to make sure that it's accurate. Oh, and so if any of you guys have questions as I'm moving through, you can feel free to submit all of that info right into the chat box and I can answer questions as we go along. I can kind of manage both. And so there's four different types of data and we have the observation, which is just your general observation data. You can do assessments and that allows you to add extra detailed information about the specific observations. There are treatments, so you can also add in additional information about your control efforts and different things that were added as a part of that, but then also doing surveys. And so this is a pretty cool option. So you can create a survey, and that's where you'll search for the presence of certain species, or you can say that they weren't found in that, in that area of that survey. 
So we'll move on to the map now. So once you get into the map section, this is one of my favorite features because you can actually see in real time where invasive species are, especially those that have been confirmed or even if they've just been submitted and not confirmed yet. And so this gives you the opportunity to search here along the top. I know this image is small, not the easiest to see, but I just wanted to make sure that you could kind of get a visual and so I'm not just showing you words on the screen. So you have the search bar here at the top of the screen and that's where you can search for your species. And then down the side, you have different options to choose from and uh, kind of divide out what's showing up on your screen. So something like choosing the different layers, if you want to use the actual hybrid map where you can see roads and maps from the satellites, or you can choose only confirmed or not confirmed species, and then just kind of going through and sorting out some of the different layers within the program. So and then you have your toolbars here across the top. So that's your search and you can kind of, so this part right here allows you to zoom in, like select and zoom in on spaces that you want to see. And then something that I think is really awesome to highlight that most people aren't aware of or don't know what it is, is this lasso tool. So what it is, is it's this thing, this button right here at the top. So you select that and say you want to just know about invasive species. I'm, I live in Oswego, so I'm interested in Oswego. So I would draw a polygon around the city of Oswego for the confirmed data that I'm interested in seeing. And if you double click, it pops up with a table where you can just scroll up and down through the table to see who's reported that information, what, what organization has reported that information, and then what species have been found within that area. And I just think this is a really um, awesome way to kind of target your searches if you're interested in looking at some of the information. But I do want to remind you all again that you can't actually download all of this data yourself. And so if you're interested in creating a project or doing something, again, just contact the IMAP and BASIS team and we can work with you the best way possible to be able to help you with that. So again, that's just the, the lasso tool. So it's just the little selection here at the top. All right, so now we'll go into the view of the table. So this is the same thing as using the map, except you get this huge result of database um, information that you can see in a, in a list form. And so I know some people are really interested in HWA right now, so you can search for that. And HWA is actually one of two species that we have designed currently where you can actually report the absence of something. So the other one is the water chestnut. And so if you are doing a water chestnut poll or doing some kind of hike, you can include the option to submit information on the presence and absence of water chestnuts or HWA. And so there might be opportunity in the future for different species to be added to this presence absence list, but as of right now, it's just the two of these. And so you can search all different information up here in the search bar and it comes up with different responses and kind of you can sort how you want to see all of that information. Okay, so then another part and so this will, this is a little bit different. So this allows you a customized search to create this query of observations within the system. And so creating this report. So you get the opportunity to go through these three simple steps. Um, choosing what type of data you're looking for, the criteria, so you can choose if you want New York State or a certain species in a certain region, so you kind of go through all of that and kind of tailor that to what you're specifically interested in, and then you can choose how you want to receive that information, whether it's on a map, in a table, um, and then so some of this might change depending on your user level as well. And then just another reminder, I apologize for repeating myself so much, but you can only download your own personal or organizational or project data, and you can't download all of the points that are viewed on the map. But when you're creating a query like this, you can, it will come up with the different responses. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now. So let's get into the website, and I'll give you an opportunity, just give me one moment. So this is the general NY IMAP Invasives.org website. And so across this top, you have all these navigational tabs. And so it gives you some different resources here, which is what we had talked about. And so you click on this and you have different information. But then also if you click resources, that's when you'll pull up that actual certified trainers network page. 
And so then there's different training videos and tutorials and quizzes and things that you can use. And then also some contact us information. And so something that is good for, for those of you is the upcoming training sessions. You'll be able to see this and this gets updated depending on when you guys are hosting trainings. If you let us know in advance, we can add that to this section. Or if you are interested, we highlight a species of the month. And so that gives you an opportunity to learn about something that you might not have necessarily been familiar with. And it gives you the chance to, to check that out. Um, so click into the login now. So that'll give you the opportunity to sign in. And so then there's some different information there for you. Um, I'll just oops, go ahead and log in for you guys. So then once you hit login, it just pulls you in. So I didn't have to say yes to the information, the uh, legal stuff, because I've already done that. And so now you'll get to this main homepage. So I had mentioned earlier the navigation tabs change depending on what user level you are. So I'm signed in with a user level two and up here on the right hand side, that's how you can tell what user level you are if you're interested. And so you just have the my IMAP invasives and then the resources section. So again, here's your navigation tabs. And if you're ever confused of where you are within the website, up here on your location, this is great to know because sometimes you can get down deep down into something and not be able to find your way back. So this is just so that you keep that, keep aware of that. And so then you have your commonly used features here, again, that we had mentioned, and then your personal information and your My IMAP Invasives data. So this is where you can choose um, what data that you've entered and you can download your information from there. And so then here's the change my password section so you can kind of go through and change, enter your old password and, and do that. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is go into this enter data. So for those of you who haven't entered data on the system, just kind of walk into this quickly. So you can select that and then it brings you up with this. So you can choose the files, you can have multiple files that you wanna upload or photos of the invasive species that you see or not we per we prefer if you do have photos because that helps us with the confirming of the species again but if you have a ton of data and you don't have photos for every single piece that's okay too we understand that so if you're not the observer again you can select it that it was someone else that was the observer for this and then you can choose what project if you're part of a certain project i know that there's some projects that oh hold on i have to select this to be able to so you can select the projects that you're associated with. And then choose what it is, plant, animal, insects, choose the species name. And it'll pop up, most of them will pop up with a photo so that you can see what your species is that you're reporting. And then you can, so that'll help you while you're confirming your observations as well. Okay, so then we have the date, you choose that, and then you choose your location. So I'm just gonna zoom in, it was right here. Yes, that's exactly where it was. And then you can go through, review your observation that you're submitting and then actually submit it, which I'm not gonna do right now because I don't need to put something into the system. All right, so now we move into the map feature. So again, I hope you can all see this a little bit better than before. So these are the different options that you can choose. Um, and so say you are interested, we had a couple people from the Western New York Prism. So you can kind of zoom into that if you want to. You can choose different watersheds that you want to search and that'll help you decide where you're at. So you can kind of see this outline of the Western New York prism here. So this is something that if you didn't know about before, hopefully you can go back in and kind of use that. And so then there's other information that you can add to decide so we can choose um, different aspects of that. And so, um, what this is, I have this zoomed right in on the SUNY ESF campus. And so again, that lasso tool that I had mentioned before here, you can just kind of draw your polygon around the area that you are interested in. Oh, look, there's a couple over here that maybe I'll be interested in. Also, you just double click that and it pulls up a list of all the species that have been reported. And so um, I just want to see if some of these have photos but you see so you can click on those observations and it should pull up a page 
Yep, so here we go. So it pulls up a page, says who reported it, when it was reported, where, and there's extra information that you can look at. So which is really good if you are interested in your campus and there's certain things that you want to know about. So um, that's enough of that. So I'm going to close that out. And so we'll go back to the um, that main page there, your My IMAP Invasives, and then you can pull up that observations table, which is one of the commonly used features. And so again, this gives you the opportunity to search for certain species that you're interested in. Say water chestnut is the one, I'm sorry if my computer is slow. Um, so water chestnut is what you're interested in learning about, and you can kind of search through um, what's been reported. So I know that we have one of our users online and all of her submissions are showing up right here. So, okay, so that's good for the observation tables. I don't see any questions coming through, so I think you guys are already good to go with all of this. Um, so your query and reports, and so this is where you can kind of go in and select different options that you're interested in. So for your geography type, you can choose, again, the prisms, if that's what you're interested in. Say you're interested in the Finger Lakes prism, um, and then you can kind of go through and sort by that, and then you can either choose to view it as a table, as a report, or on the map. And so I, I'll typically, I, I'm, a, I'm a visual person, so I like the map section, um, but not everybody does. So that's all up to how you're looking and what you're interested in finding out. Um, so, oh yeah, so then this is your uh, My IMAP Invasives tab, again, down in your profile your user information. So this is so that you can change, tell people how to change their password. And this is the email alert page that comes up. So there's no alerts on here. So you can add a new alert right here. And so they, oh yeah, it notes that they're just sent nightly. And so you can consider all reports, continual, early detection, geography. And again, you can choose by the prism that you're in. So you're crisp down in the cat skills. So all of that information can be added right into your user alert. And so as you can see, there's a lot of information that you can kind of edit and filter it so that you're not necessarily getting a million emails, which you're not going to get a million emails from it anyway. And so for those of you who use Outlook, you can always set up rules or different things so that it doesn't blow up your inbox. It'll go into a specific folder that you can view at a later time. So again, I'm just going to leave that page. So then here, so now we are done with the My IMAP Invasives page. So we walked through your tabs, your commonly used features, your personal information, and then also downloading your data. So we walked through all of that. So now you can go into your resources. And so this is where, again, there's some extra information. So depending on, I'm a user level two right now. So you can download the observation field forms and there's some different stuff that you can download for that. There is the projects guide, which is pretty interesting. That would be helpful for those of you who are interested in creating projects. But then it also gives you to the user manual, which is very helpful, the app user manual, and then some different stuff. So that projects guide, we'll talk this about this a little bit more. This is when you, if you want to create a project for what you're doing, you, it gives you step-by-step -step information and directions on how to create that. And so if you haven't liked the Facebook page already, there is an IMAP Invasives Facebook page where they will report and give you different information on invasive species. If you haven't liked the page already, check it out. And you can do that. And then I think that's about good for the website. So I'm going to minimize this for now and we can get back into this a little bit more in a few minutes. Okay. All right, so now we'll go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so say you don't really want to go through the whole website because that's not what your target or your intentions are. You want to get people right outdoors, right out in the field, and then not worry about that. So what you can do is go ahead and do the mobile app training. And so this is a good way to help prep your trainers on what uh, or prep your audience on what the app actually is. And it's just kind of quick, easy steps. You can show some screenshots on a screen or walk around with the audience, depending on how big your group is. And so just a reminder that the mobile app is only for submitting observations and um, uploading those to the database. And so 
when you have someone first download the app, they'll get this loading screen and it'll pop up with these instructions, the welcome menu instructions. And so they have the menu at the top, add observations, you can scroll around and it just gives them, this is something that pops up every time so that they can know what they're looking for. And so you can see in the background a little bit these yellow observations back here. There's a couple of fake species that were on my mobile app when I took the screenshot. But then also here is a report of garlic mustard that I went and saw. And so there's some actual plants that are, um, I took a photo of. So that's one of the photo photos that was being submitted with my observation. Um, so once you get someone into the app, they go to their preferences, which is up under a top menu tab here. And you can have them fill out their preferences. So their first name, last name, that IMAP username, which is the first three letters and the full last name, and then their IMAP password. And so if they haven't changed that for their training yet, they'll have that change me 2018 password, or if they have changed it, then they'll have to submit that. And then they, it gives them the opportunity right here to decide what they want their stuff to come up as. So say you're just doing an HWA training, but you know that there's one or two other invasive species like garlic mustard along the trails that you're walking. So you can have them customize a species list just to have HWA and garlic mustard and Japanese knotweed or something. Um, so you can customize that so that when you actually get into the app, you're not sorting through all of the species that are in the system. You can minimize it so that it's easier to do that. And so this is something that if I know, um, say I'm hosting a training on ESF's campus, I'll go through customize my species list and just select the ones that I know are there. In this way, it's easier for me to be able to search through. It makes it quicker, more efficient. Um, the picture quality, I always choose 100%, but you can do 50 or 25, depending on your phone um, or your tablet that you're using. Your satellite versus road maps, and then the zoom. Um, so if you're involved with a project, you would select the project that you're involved with and have them, your audience, choose that project so that when they're reporting species through their app, it's going to that project. And then also those welcome instructions that you see here, you can actually select to turn those off. And sometimes we update the different, the data, the species in the list and different stuff. And so occasionally you should just go ahead and update that. Or if you're hosting a training, make sure that people, if they've had the app for a while, they go through and update the state's data. So then once you get all that done, you'll have this main menu and have people add observations. This is where they can take a photo and they can submit one photo with their observation, choose the project. Um, if they have their custom list, they can open up their custom list and just search through that or not. Choose the date, the location, add comments. Comments are really good for us or for other natural resource professionals who, or those of you who are trainers, to be able to kind of learn more about what the observation is, where it was found, some different info that you can add into that. And then once you have created these um, different observations, you'll again select that top menu piece. Here's where your preferences are. But then you'll upload, select all, and then upload the selected. And that's how they'll immediately go up into the system. And if you have your audience members who are having technical difficulties or issues, there are ways that we can try to work around that. So if you do have that happen, make sure that you contact the IMAP and Basins team as soon as you can. Let them know or let us know that you can't get someone's phone in and just let us know what kind of phone it is and what you're using for IMAP and Basins. Okay, so something that's really good with trainings and just kind of education overall, as I'm sure many of you already know, is that if you give somebody a take-home assignment, it gives them that opportunity or that drive to, to do that. So say you're working with a certain organization, a soil and water conservation district, and you have a select group of stakeholders. And what you can do is just say, okay, you know, by the end of the week, I want everyone within this project to submit a new observation. Or let's have a competition and see who can submit the most amount of observations by the end of the month. And you can do something like that if you're looking for a certain project. So this is a screenshot of Cobalt Skills Campus. And if you look at the mouse on the screen, you can see I'm tracing along a stream. And so there are, there's a cluster of invasive species reported at the beginning of the stream, and then there's nothing 
throughout the whole part of campus until the end. And so say you are a professor at Cobal Steel and you want to find out if there's any other invasive species along that stream, you can create a project and have your, if you're working with students or whoever, and have them report or look for invasive species along that and then report it. So this can help you close in gaps of regions that you're working in and different things to kind of get people more involved and encourage them to, to feel empowered to, to go out there and actually do something um, following up. And so something that we see a lot is that people are taking the training or taking multiple trainings and the only time they ever submit observation is during their actual training class. And so we're hoping to try and help change this a little bit by using the or having the trainers give new assignments or different things for the audiences to take home and kind of move forward with. And so at the end of your training, it's always good to kind of give the final messages of why IMAP invasives is important and why you're looking for their help to report these invasive species. So if they're professionals in the field, then they understand that it's important for managing the property or priori prioritizing tasks, things like that. But also from like the citizen science aspect or a student asset aspect, is you get the opportunity to conduct research or um, you have people networking, collaborating, building partnerships with other organizations and just learning about stuff that they might not have known about. You're getting them up and outside to look for stuff, um, helping people get a little bit more active. And so I do wanna share a quote with everybody um, from a woman named Karen Cooper. And if you haven't heard of her before, I'll share her name in the chat box. And she is a huge advocate for citizen science. She's written a book on it. She works with people all over the world. She presented for a TED Talk. Um, so I just wanted to share a quote from her from one of her videos that I found online. And she said, we can no longer ignore the fact that there are things that scientists will never be able to discover alone. Citizen science's growth is inevitable because science has advanced in so many areas that to keep pushing some of those frontiers, Scientists need to collaborate, not just with each other, but with everyone. As we sail forward into the future, we are leaving a lot of problems in our wake. The good news is, science is fun, it is healthy, and it's social. It's a hobby that can enrich the rest of your life. Science, as a hobby, is more accessible and more in need of you now more than ever before. So I just thought that was a really interesting quote, something to help give the audience, you know, give them the, the know that they need, scientists need their help, that they need this. And so we would not have all of these observations within the IMAP Invasives database if it wasn't for the people who, some of you who are on the line who are reporting invasive species while you're not working, or as a citizen, or um, if you've attended trainings and just reporting those. So we wouldn't have all of that information if it wasn't for that. So education is huge and being able to make sure that they feel that they're a part of something bigger than what they are, you know, that's really helpful as well. So once you finish your training, the only, there's only a couple things that you have to do. Just go back through with your initial sign-in sheet and your registration, figure out who attended, who didn't, submit evaluations and sign on sheets to, or sign in sheets to the IMAP and Mason's team so that we can also reconcile those who did not attend, we can contact them, or you can contact them to see if they're still interested. And then always following up with answering questions that you weren't able to answer, um, sending those evaluations and contact information. And so we will be providing you with that link for the evaluation, so you'll be able to submit that to them and then we can share the evaluation results with you. It gives us and you an opportunity to improve programming and then know where we need to work on different things within the actual program. And so again, um, the email addresses, it's good to, if you want, if you don't mind copying us on those emails so that we can stay involved and help, help you answer questions as you move forward. Okay, so just a couple quick reminders about your training day. I know I've been talking at you guys for a while now, so I'm sorry. And I'm still going. <laughs> um, so some training reminders for the day of is have your sign-in sheet printed, ready to go. Make sure that you copy that, email it to the IMAP and basis team, covering all the materials that you plan to cover. And so this will depend on the training that you're planning on hosting. But if you want to, if you're including the outdoor portion, you are um, covering the invasive species that you're going to see so that they know how to identify them 
or when you're out in the field, making sure that you're pointing those out so that people can see them, or if you're just going to show pictures or bring in the specimen. Again, that depends on what you're doing. Um, something else as a reminder is that Internet Explorer does not work well with IMAP invasives. So you should use the Firefox, Google Chrome, or Safari. Those are all good compatible web browsers that you can use if you're using a desktop. I used Safari today and it seems to, I don't ever have issues with Safari unless of course my internet is not working at home. And um, there are some age limitations to IMAP invasives and using IMAP invasives. So we do require that people are 13 and older. However, this doesn't stop you from collecting or creating a project and working with your students to go out in the field, record all these observations and then uploading it as a project and that will help the um, leader of that, the teacher or whoever it might be, kind of do that first level of making sure that the correct species are being reported into the system. So then there are, make sure that you're emphasizing that photos of the observations are really important because that helps us from the back end of things be able to confirm reports of invasive species, but then also so that when other people are looking at the system, they can actually go through and look at those photos as well. And then again, when you're hosting your training, collecting questions from your audience, if you might not have the answer to, I mean, I don't have the answers to everything. I'm still, I still learn things all the time. Um, so just making sure that you're collecting that information and submitting that to the IMAP team or looking it up or asking the network for the answers later on just so that you can know what is going on with different aspects of IMAP invasives that you're not necessarily familiar with. So something that I'll do often is create a title slide. I think most of you probably saw I had a title slide for the webinar. And so I'll just create a title slide that, and sometimes they'll just say, while you're waiting for the program to begin, please download the IMAP invasives app or something like that, or like, here's your usernames, you know, first three letters, full last name, here's your passwords, try to get signed in if you're doing a mobile app and it's part of your training, or you can do it if people are using computers as well. So just to keep it in mind that there is ways that you guys can get technical support during your trainings, before your trainings, things like that. So if you think that you're going to be having 100 people signing on computers all at the same time into IMAP invasives and reporting invasive species, um, that's something that we do appreciate knowing in advance so that we can try to stop any issues from happening with too many users in the same room on the same system trying to sign in or if you're having some other type of issues during business hours, you can contact Jennifer Dean or Colleen Lutz. And then also you can contact me if it's during your training hours and it's evenings or weekends. Um, and then also there's the two email addresses here that you can, oops, the two email addresses that you can contact people on. And so again, just kind of putting that subject as New York, trainers network or IMAP trainers network or something like that, just so that we can know what the email is for. So just a little bit about user levels. This was a question that I've gotten during each of the trainings that I've hosted so far. And so I just want to quickly go over some of these, um, just a little bit of information about it. And so this information you can find in the IMAP Invasives user manual on your resources page. And so the different levels are important to know because if you want to create a project or do an assessment <clears throat> or a survey, or if you're treating, doing treatments, um, so this is really important for you to know what the user levels are. And if you need to change your user level, then you can put that into an email, send it to the IMAP Invasives team, and we can work with you to make sure you have the proper training or whatever you might need to be able to move up to that new user level. So there is the view only. So these are people who sign up without attending a training. They just want to view stuff. They're not submitting any observations. Then there you have your level two, which is observations. And I think at least 50% of you on the call right now are only a user level two. But if you are interested in creating assessments, surveys, projects, things like that, again, just let us know. Um, so then there's level three for assessments. And this allows you to include additional information of um, certain areas that are infested. Then you have your user level four, which is to create surveys. So you can plan your areas out that you want to survey. And then you can say that you either found a certain invasive species or you didn't find if you're looking for certain things. 
So there's different aspects to creating service. Um, level five are project leads. And I know that a lot of people are interested in creating projects within IMAP and BASIS. So this can be based on grants or classes that you teach or classes that you work with or camps that you work with, things like that. And it can depend on whatever you're working on or focused on, you can create a project for that. And so um, I, I'll give you a little bit of information on projects in the next slide. But basically, we're just collect, we have to collect a little information. IMAP and BASIS will create that for you, and then you can have your project. Um, so then there's level six and seven for treatments or infestations. So not that many people. I think there's a couple of you on the line that are actually six or sevens. And then, um, so again, with the user level five, so the projects. So we have the opportunity for you to do this. So we just need more information from you as the um, administrator for your project. And so the project name, who the lead is, the description of what the project is or what you're hoping to get out of it. And then including a start date, end date, if there is one, if it's ongoing, you know, that's good for us to know as well. This can always be changed later. And then if you're working with other organizations, you can let us know about that. But this is also something that you can edit. And then also, who are the project members and what their usernames are, or first and last names. And so we need all of that information so that we can get this into the system so you can have a project. Okay. So say you have a project that you've collected data on and the way to download the data for that project is the same way you would download your own IMAP and basis data. I believe you do have to be the lead for the project to be able to download it, but I don't know for, for certain for that. But um, if you are the lead for the project, you can go into the download my observations data and then you can um, select to download from a project. And again, you can choose if you want that to be in a CSV file, or you can also download it into a um, shape file that you can work with ArcGIS, which is, if anyone uses ArcGIS, that's a great opportunity for that. All right, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit here. And so, kind of get you guys a little bit more involved. I know that we've been on the line for a good hour now, so it's nice to kind of switch things up a little bit. So let's kind of take a moment. So at the beginning, we kind of talked about your goal and your audience. And so now I want you to add to that. And so try to think of a date that you will have as your target date for your first training, um, a location, and then kind of a little bit about your field component or um, what else you want to include. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everybody two minutes. I'm going to mute myself for two minutes. And I will actually ask a handful or a couple of you guys to kind of share some of your information out loud. And so just um, if you want to do that, you can just chat to me that you'll share out loud or I'll um, chat some of you guys to ask. So I'll give you two minutes and then we'll reconnect and get going with that. All right, so I give you guys a little bit of extra time. Um, I was kind of chatting with a few people with questions in the chat box. So I hope I answered mostly everyone's questions. I do have some jotted down that I'll um, respond to at, in a few minutes when we get to the end. So the first person that I'm going to um, try to unmute is, so Kristen, I have you unmuted. Hi everyone, my name is Kristen King. I work for OPRHP. I already kind of mentioned my goal in the chat box, but kind of just to reiterate it a little bit, training boat stewards, they're young, they're usually in college, so they're a really great audience to teach them so they can carry on these skills with them. Location would be their uh, boat steward training that we do every year in May. Definitely want to include a field component and we definitely want to include identification. We focus on aquatic invasive species. So specifically for this training, we always like to have a computer, a projector, internet access. Um, it's not on this chart, but they all need to be tech savvy. They use tablets to collect data. So that's definitely something that they have to have. And they're going to be in the field when they're using IMAPs. So we do want to really have a 
big component for the app and getting them out in the field. So maybe like a little bit of a slideshow inside and then try to really get them out and um, use it that way. Great, that's great. Thanks, Kristen. No problem. All right, so I got you muted again. So then I'm going to unmute Megan. Uh, Megan, are you there? Okay, um, so uh, Slilo Prism, we host a uh, species specific workshops with a goal to gain participation in early detection efforts. So we have uh, three different species that we're focusing on now, hemlock willy adelgid, emerald ash borer, and fanwort, or um, uh, fanwort. And so we'll have these workshops during the season when these invasive species are likely to be observed. And then we, we do our trainings for how to identify them and how to use IMAP to report observations, and we usually have a field component component involved, so uh, it works out pretty good. And I do have active volunteers that use IMAP, so that's how we um, go about using it. Great, thanks, Megan. Yeah. Um, the the next person to share. Let me see. All right, Caroline, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Yes. Great. So I work for the New York State Hemlock Initiative, and we train volunteers all over the state to um, to report presence and absence of hemlock woolly adelgid so that we can figure out where it is and isn't. We're particularly focused right now on Warren County in the Adirondacks, where they've just found it for the first time in the Adirondacks this summer. Um, we're planning, at, I think we have six trainings on the books right now, and we're hoping to incorporate an IMAP training component into it. Our challenge is that a lot of our volunteers um, don't have smartphones or aren't particularly technically savvy. So I think we're going to focus on the app, but, I'm, but as I think about it more, I think I might incorporate the, I'm, I'm, I'm debating whether I'll, I'll incorporate the online component or whether I will just tell them to send me the points and I'll enter them for them. So. Um, we will we will have a computer, we'll have internet access, and we'll be, be outdoors most of the time as well. So um, we will probably walk through the app inside and then go outside and have people um, give it a try. Great, thanks for sharing. I like that um, you said that as you're thinking about it more, you're kind of changing your plans for it. And so um, something that's nice about the app for many of you, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, is that you can actually use the app without uh, without data. And so also you can um, kind of get into the system, take those photos and stuff, and then once you get back to access, um, cell phone access, you can submit those then. And so it, it is difficult sometimes when you don't have um, internet, but you can do it. So we have one more person that is going to share out loud. Um, just give me one second. Hey, Eric, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. All right, so um, my name is Eric Struning. Um, like I mentioned in the chat before, um, I'm actually a technician, um, primarily in the environmental science depart, uh, realm and within the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Environmental Sciences here at uh, SUNY Cobleskill. And like you guys saw before on the slideshow um, put together by Brittany, um, I've been primarily responsible for this um, kind of initiative here at our campus. Um, I've tried to incorporate it into several of our classes just to get students more involved in um, using the app and identifying invasive species, because as we all know, invasive species are playing a detrimental part to our environment. Um, so I've worked with uh, Dr. Jennifer Dean. Um, she's actually come here to our campus a couple times. Um, lectured a little bit and then actually I took them in the field after the lecture um, in the afternoon and we actually went to certain sites across our campus. Um, I've worked with also certain students doing special projects with IMAP invasives so I'd go out with them to a site we'd look um, if they wanted to target certain things we would focus on those uh, specific species um, and that's pretty much the overview that I've done you know here at our campus and the goal for this spring is actually to incorporate it a little bit more with our upper level courses to maybe incorporate more GIS into the program um, with identifying certain species and also to getting involved with uh, the New York State Office of Parks and Rec um, out at Skodak Island State Park. Um, I've wor worked with that park manager before on other projects so we're going to incorporate that with their um, park as well. 
Great. Thanks, Eric, for sharing your information. Jessica, I'm going to call on you. I'm going to unmute you and let me know if you can. Sure. So every year um, we bring in a new group, usually of um, interns, seasonal employees and volunteers. Um, and they're all already kind of trained in aquatic invasive species stuff because we have a, a small but a watershed sewer program on the river. And I want to reach out more to the rest of these employees and interns as far as like kind of using them as helping me and our staff as natural resource staff with being able to see things where they are on the river because it's, it's pretty, it's 73 miles and so it's a lot of space that we're, we can't really do with just three people surveying. Great, so it sounds like you already have a, a captive audience that you can target, especially to start off with this year. Donna, can you hear me? I've unmuted you. So you want, so my training, so I have trained our station, field station interns. Um, SUNY Oneonta has a field station up on um, Otsego Lake. But this year I was hoping to try to tempt some students in a botany club. Uh, as I said, some will have an interest in invasives. Most all have an interest in plants, but I'll have to first make the compelling case to uh, why we need to be aware of the location, and I think that would be the heavier message. And then I was thinking of taking some subset of that class to teach how to do the observations. Great, and that's an interesting perspective too, is that they are coming from a different aspect where they're interested in the plants and everything else. And so, I mean, invasives are involved in that and definitely have an impact on what they're what they use or look at. Right. Most of the club has an interest in, you know, local flora or rare species. Um, so they're not unaware of invasives, but I'm not sure what their level of, well, I should say this, there will be some that do have a good interest, but part of it will be luring in those who have a less, uh, you know, more moderate interest. Good. And so do you, do you work with them that, uh, that whole group every year is that what you No, well this would be the first time I've tried to approach that particular group um, but in the summer I have run as I said um, training for our interns who are right at the lake and most of it's going to be Lake Otsego centric reporting. Great that's awesome. All right so let's see I'm going to unmute somebody else now. Um, so Donna I have you muted again. So, um, Wanda, I've, I've unmuted you. Can you I hear can me hear okay, you very Wanda? Well. Uh, yeah, I want to, well, I've always been interested in invasive species. We, um, we have a property here that I've had to have um, the uh, APIPP come in to and uh, mitigate some yellow iris and, um, and not weed for us. Uh, it is an Indian lake, um, but there are many others that people are not aware of, but I do have a very captive audience in our lake association, so I'd like to hopefully get everybody on board for that. There are people that already monitor the lake itself, but not necessarily the shoreline, and the yellow iris has shown up, so <laughs> there's one, one place to start. And um, there are, um, in the garden club, uh, they they actually had a plant sale at farmer's market, and um, when I went in there to look, they were selling invasive species in pots. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so there, there probably is some need. Um, there's probably people that are aware, but just want to bring some awareness. And, you know, having that app and making the observation kind of legitimizes what your sightings are. So hopefully that'll work. Yeah, that's great. I think that's all of our biggest fears is to go somewhere and see that, you know, when people are selling invasive species or seeds of invasive species and things like that is kind yep. of scary. Let's see. Frank, I'm going to unmute you again. Frank, can you hear me I okay? Can. Great. If you want to go ahead and share what your plan or goals are now. Uh, well, I've got uh, two local outing groups. One is a, uh, a ski club that does a lot of cross-country skiing and the other one's a group that does a uh, uh, kayaking, snowshoeing, and cross-country skiing. And they both said that they're very interested in helping search local forests for the hemlock woolly adelgid, or evidence of, or hopefully lack of. So uh, looking at getting them trained and getting them all on the IMAP and BASIS app. Great. Yeah, and so um, that sounds like a good project idea also, is kind of um, getting a group together. So something that 
we do in the summertime is like a water chestnut chasers challenge. Mm -hmm. So that could be something that you could do also for those who are out there kayaking. Um, I don't know if you've used that before, if you have interest in that, but just some ideas to keep in mind. Wendy Patterson, she's from the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper, um, formerly Riverkeeper. And so she doesn't have a mic, but she did share to everybody that um, they're hoping to empower their volunteers to kind of get out there and take those responsibilities on, especially at restoration sites. And so they do have locations um, at Hyde Park and Niagara Falls, which is great, and so that they're going to use their volunteers. And so this was actually a question that Patricia Schulenberg had asked earlier was, if your volunteers are signed up underneath your organization or listed under your project, can they can you download their data and the answer to that is yes so you would have to um get the correct level user level um into the system and then you can have them report and then you can actually use the data that they're submitting for your specific project so that's something that we can talk about more offline if you're interested in creating projects i know some professors do like to create their own projects and then they can see and use the data that all of their students have been submitting into the system um, whether it's around their campus or um, some other like field station areas or things around their campus hey jordan i have you unmuted can you can you hear me okay yeah can you hear me yeah so for our program um i'm part of the new york state parks watercraft inspection program and um, we use imaps to kind of train our stewards on um, creating observations of primarily aquatic invasive species in the field um, they have the choice to um, use their own phones but we also provide tablets which they use um, for their jobs during the summer um, but um, to kind of give um, an overview of our first training, it would be coinciding with our training for our boat stewards. Um, we would have them, you know, we would give a presentation. They would have access to a computer projector. It would be sometime in early May. And, um, you know, shortly after giving them a presentation, introducing them to you know the platform giving them each their usernames and passwords and showing them how it works we would take them into the field shortly after and really give them an overview and some basic identification uh, skills of terrestrial as well as aquatic invasive species eventually um, so that they could upload their own observations and uh, use it on their own personal time if they'd like even when they're away from their jobs Great, thank you for sharing, Jordan. So I know that you come from the watercraft inspection world so that you'll have a captive audience that you primarily target. And so they'll kind of have some prior knowledge as well, which is good. And it's nice because I know some of you, other, the others on the line also have um, a captive audience that they're targeting, which is great. Okay, so Jordan, I have you muted again. So now I will unmute. William, William, I have you unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, I can hear you. There we go. That's perfect. So if you want to just share a little bit about yourself and what you would hope to do. Well, what I do for uh, the state of New York, I'm a horticulture inspector, a regional supervisor. I have the western region, which is from Syracuse to Buffalo. I have five inspectors underneath me. And what we use IMAP Invasives for is basically is we monitor that. It's a detection service for us. We are one of the agencies that if there's something significant, such as Asian longhorn beetle or hemlock wood adelgid, we would be a, an agency that would go there and identify that and collect a, a sample and, uh, and send it to the lab to get identification. Um, we normally do that. If there's a county that is uh, has a, uh, no positive positives yet, then we would go there. Once there is a positive, we don't get involved because we consider that a positive county. Uh, currently, we we probably won't do any training. Maybe some in-house training with the other inspectors. Uh, we're not really our agency doesn't want us to do training, but many of us 
on our personal level, myself included, want to be more involved in that because we do an awful lot of invasive species work. And I think we want to carry that on to our, you know, our personal life. Um, we, many of us do get the IMAP invasives uh, uh, bulletins or pest alerts. And like I said, we do check on those occasionally, especially if there's something uh, very important like Asian longhorn beetle, hemlock, blue, belgid. Um, meaning we deal with plants, not too many, not too much activity with aquatic pests. But I think it's a great system for us because there's a lot of eyes out there looking. Uh, the part you talked about earlier, the photographs, that's excellent because it they speak basically a thousand words if it's a nice clear picture. It's very helpful. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, so it's nice to hear from from your aspect of things. I mean, you're a little bit different working with your other other staff that you're working with, but then you also want to bring it into your personal life. And so there's you know that really brings in the citizen science aspect of things where we have people all around the state who aren't involved from a work perspective, who are interested in learning more and, you know, finding a new way to be involved. So that's great. So I, um, let's see, one second. So I just have to look into the chat box. So, okay, so Kate shared, she is from the Finger Lakes Institute. And so she shared a little bit more about what their plans are. So William, I do have you muted again, just so you know. Um, but so Kate works with the strike teams. And so what they're trying to do is encourage their team to actually continue submitting observations outside of work. And so their primary region that they work in is the Finger Lakes. And so they'll keep that um, focused on aquatic and riparian plants and specimens in the field. And she's hoping to host her training sometime in June. And so then um, Ashley also shared that their goal is to begin building a map for invasive species at their park and to continue raising invasive awarenesses and kind of get the citizen science aspect into the park as well. And so they're, the general public is their audience. And so then that's, you know, another reason. So um, Jordan and William mentioned if they are going to work with each other and train each other within their organizations. But then if you're going to aim more at the general public, you do have to include other aspects in your training as well. And so Ashley's pain or main priority is to get people trained out in June and get out there learning more about invasive species. And so again, you, as I kind of mentioned before, so it kind of really depends on what your audiences, you know, if they're, if they can use mobile phones, if they're really good with them, if they could just download the apps quick, you don't have to really give a lot of instruction. And then if you have those people who really just need step-by-step -step full instructions, and then you can really change your audience or change your program to that. So I know that you can host a, an IMAP invasive training for 30 minutes, or you could have it for six hours where you do a four hour hike included. And so I know that somebody had mentioned in the chat box, they were questioning about how long the typical training is, I would say about an hour is a good average time so that depending on what you want to do, if you want to be indoors, outdoors, and how many components you want to include. And so it doesn't need to be a super long thing or if it's just an event in the morning at a park, you can do that and then have people, um, you know, if it's there's other events and stuff like that on at the park that day. And so that's something that we kind of talk about is if there's other components that you can include in your training or within that day that draw people to the area. And so something that I'll talk a little bit more about as we go through as well, and that will be, um, you know, if you have the ID section included, that'll help draw more people in, or say you have the um, there's an event at a state park or within the region or it's a certain day of the year, I'll share some dates as well and you can kind of focus it on that. All right, so thank, thank you to those of you who shared about a little bit more about your goals and everything. Um, it helps me kind of understand where you're coming from, what you're interested in. But then, so now I kind of want to not just talk about your audience and who you're targeting, but kind of get a little bit more personal and so I'm going to those of you who didn't share with your goals for that, I'm probably going to call on you for this if, uh, if your microphones are working. And so 
Um, what I want to I want to know is more about why you, you want to be part of the Stringers Network. So if you're uh, looking for certain opportunities or you're hoping to host a, two or three trainings per year, just kind of a little bit more information about what you want to get out of this network as a whole. And that will help me gauge what kind of information I need to share with you guys moving forward or what else you guys need from me so that I can make sure that, you know, I'm giving you everything that you need. All right, so thanks James for sharing in the chat box. I know you mentioned your mic isn't really working or if you're not sure if it actually does work or not. Um, so, I, so many of you guys have probably read that James is with the DOT. And so it's really nice to see if that you can, I mean, potentially even incorporate some of this training into herbicide trainings and days where people are already that captive audience that are there. If you're interested in being a part of it, um, and I, it's definitely interesting to look at the roadways as corridors for species traveling around. I mean, we hear about the boaters who are moving aquatic invasive species from one location to another, but then also you have um, plants that are on the roadside and that uh, are getting dug up and moved around as well. So it's great to see that you're interested in becoming involved. I think that in the last webinar, we had somebody from DOT as well. So it's great to see you on the line. Um, so I'm going to, Catherine, I'm going to unmute you. Catherine, are you there? You're unmuted now. Uh, yeah. Great. If you want to share, like, why you want us to become involved or what you're hoping to get out of this. Well, um, because I work so often with invasive species along riparian areas, I think, and I also work with a lot of different school groups over the season um, for different plantings and to try and involve them and educate them in invasive species management um, and how that can relate to, you know, um, its effect on native species and also how it can relate to uh, climate change or actually more probably how climate change might affect the uh, in invasive species um, distribution over time and so you know by trying to get them involved different school groups involved early on is something that i think would be really beneficial to them but it's also very beneficial to me as a program um, i manage a program called cat skill streams buffer initiative here in delaware county and so we have about 20 plus different municipalities that i work with uh, but also quite a number of different school groups or school systems within Delaware County. And, you know, so when I can, when I work with those kids, hopefully I can have them get interested along with their teachers in when they go out to possibly, you know, input all of this information. And then as I go through my program and my different projects with them, that I can see over time how th things might change if we do different activities like plantings or actual invasive species control projects um, that I can possibly see over time, have them do the monitoring of those projects rather than me having to go out and do that because it gets a little bit overwhelming. Uh, so that's kind of, it would help me as a program to, um, to try and involve those different groups. And not just the students, but the teachers as well, because there's a very active group of teachers in Delaware County dealing with climate change um, and, and all of those related subjects. So hopefully that will help me in doing what I do. Um, and then um, what else should I answer? <laughs> no, no, yeah, that's great. That's, it's good to hear it too. Like, I mean, I feel like that's a different perspective also. So you not only want them to help with what your overarching project is, but kind of get those little projects created within the system and so that they can look more at the overall problem and then just kind of funnel it up to you instead of kind of all that extra work, which is great. And it's good to hear, I mean, I've worked with teachers um, over the summer a lot on this uh, great like ecosystem education exchange program that we created through my, my other work with New York Sea Grant. And sometimes the, teachers are just so passionate about what they want to bring into their classrooms and they, they just want to get involved in stuff over the summer. And sometimes their students kind of follow suit. You know, if you get those really interested teachers, they join in, so. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it's actually groups of different ages because I work not with like SUNY Delhi actually in doing some invasive mm -hmm. species control with them. I have interns that I work with in the summer that are actually from SUNY Delhi. But I also work with all of the different more local like um, Margaretville, Roxbury, the Delhi Academy, the you know Walton Central School, Andes. So I've worked with all of those um, schools before. And, um, you know, so we are I'm pre presently trying to organize and plan some plantings for the spring. Um, and so very possibly I could include this in some of that training or some of those planting um, projects. And they do, these school groups, the school systems also have environmental clubs. And those typically um, ha are the older students. And so that might be a really good way to involve some of them as well. Yeah, for sure. And maybe you could even recruit some of those uh, SUNY Delhi students to, to help you with the trainings and get them involved with teaching others too. <laughs> Pass on that torch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very possibly. Great, thank you. So, um, Charlotte, I am going to unmute you now. Charlotte, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Can everyone else hear me? Yeah, good. Um, so, the reason I'm becoming a certified trainer is because it's really easy to tack this on to the trainings that we already do um, for people identifying HWA around the state. And it's really helpful to have more people out there um, talking about IMAP and how to use it because uh, it's a tool that anyone can use if you like I guess anyone with a phone um, so that's that's kind of what we're, we're hoping to do and it's also nice because for our volunteers a lot of them are not really necessarily aware of what's going on around the state and this gives them the chance to look at a map and really feel like they are part of a statewide initiative because they are. And so it's a nice tool for that as well. For sure. And just sometimes them feeling as they're part of something bigger is all that it really takes to get them involved too, which is nice. Exactly. Great. All right. So I'm going to, everybody is muted again. And so for me, it's just, I'm interested in learning for my research and stuff is, a little bit more about why you want to become a certified trainer, what certification you're hoping to achieve, uh, different opportunities you're looking for as being part of this network, what you want to get out of it. And so that's something that I will be collecting afterwards. So this will be something that is important to you, but then also important to me. So what are you hoping to get out of the network? If there's something that I missed in this training that you really think you need to learn more about, let me know and I can do some kind of training or upload a video or something that you can use to help build your work around IMAP invasives. And so with that, I kind of, I know that when we sent out the actual call for trainers, it was a little bit different. So there were three tiers. There was your basic advanced and master. We actually changed that up because there's a little bit too much at the beginning. And so now we have a basic trainer and master trainer. And so to be a basic trainer, you just have to host the training in your community and one per year. But to be a master trainer, to receive an actual certificate, you do have to host three trainings and it can be through work, through your community or however you wanna do it. You can partner with other people in the network and host the trainings. And then after that, you'll have to host two per year to be stayed, to be kept on the list as a master trainer. And so what I'll be doing is giving you a certification plan document. And so that goal, so all the information that we went over the past two slides. So that stuff will give you what you need for this certification plan. And so I'm looking to hear a little bit about the month that you plan for your first training on location, some anything that you can add to provide to me to help me work around that and help you plan. And then also, um, so there's three steps to it. So the initial training received via webinar, which you're getting today, so that is checked off your list. Then I just need the certification plan document for you, and you just answered those questions yourself. So now you just have to kind of type them up separately and send them to me, and then you need to host your first training. So I gave you hopefully all the resources and the information that you need, and within a couple weeks, you'll have all those templates and resources, everything uploaded to the website so that you can use those as well.
now that we've kind of covered all of that stuff, now there's some other aspects that I really want to highlight for all of you on the line is that this trainer's network is a network. It's just that. So what I want to do is try to create a way for you guys to be able to work with each other, stay in contact. So what we did is we created a Facebook page for the IMAP trainers. And so I'm going to open this up. And so what this is, is an opportunity. There's nothing on here right now. I just, I just created it for the trainers as we're building this network. And so we can have, if say somebody gets asked for a training or they need help with a training or you have questions or we have questions, um, we'll post this information into here. So you can go ahead. If, if anyone's interested, you can like the page. We already have, there's 11 people that follow right now, but we will continue building this up. And so what I want to know is if you think that this is the best way for a platform of communication. I know that we can do email, but I feel like sometimes email just gets overwhelming. So many people get, you get different mass emails that you don't necessarily read. But I know that if you're scrolling through social media or something like that, you might be more apt to read the information or respond to questions and chat on a, a different level with other people within the network. So if you think that's a great way, go ahead, like that Facebook page. We'll start adding new information to it as well. And so something else that we're trying to figure out how to do this in the best way is kind of allowing you all to give updates on your trainings, on the projects you're working on, how you're using IMAP Invasives, the work that you're doing. And so maybe writing short articles and submitting those. We can share those through a listserv or share on the website, just trying to find a new way for the work that you're using IMAP Invasives, or the work that you're doing and using IMAP Invasives is a great way to um, share that and kind of show everyone else what you're doing, give other people ideas to, to create their own work. Um, also, then we have the contact, contact information for those of you who are interested in hosting trainings. We can include a list of people and email addresses or how we want to design that so that we can have people actually be able to be contacted for hosting trainings if that's what you want to do. Or if you have other ideas, I'm way more than happy to take all of that from all of you and kind of create new ways to connect. And so I just don't want this to be a network that you join and it just dies off. We want to be able to keep everybody involved and keep people moving together. Um, so there is a question in the chat box is all oh, about it not always showing up in your news feed. So that's good to know. So I'll try to look into that to figure out ways to um, see how to get that to go up into the news feed. I'm not a huge social media person, so I'm working on uh, learning more about how it all works. But. All right. So um, some dates to keep in mind. So these are some things that might help you when you're trying to plan your first training. So as you can see, there's a lot of Aprils on here. So IMAP Invasive says a spring bio blitz. And this is something that if you're interested in working with your local prison, prism, not prison, um, your prism, and you can work with them to host trainings or ho help them host trainings around the state in the early springtime. So this ranges really anywhere from March to June, but April, May is a good time. Um, April is actually National Volunteer Month, so you can try to get some new volunteers in to come in. And again, this is a new way to kind of grab their attention. And then there's Citizen Science Day here, which is April 14th. And so the only thing that I'm confused about with Citizen Science Day is that it's April 14th through May 21st. So I don't know why they don't call it a month, but if you want to host training this on April 14th this year, that would be great. I can help work with you to do that. Earth Day is April 22nd. And then also the 5th Annual Invasive Species Awareness Week. The dates are July 8th through the 14th this year. So if you're interested in having people um, learn more about invasive species during Invasive Species Awareness Week, this is a good opportunity. Those dates are great for you. And so if you host something in April and then you host something in July or um, April, May, June, and July, you'll have four trainings, become a master certified trainer. And so it's just, it's nothing too crazy, but if you have questions or need help trying to plan some of this out, you can please feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to help you plan some of that information. The final thing that I am going to talk to you about is the feedback and evaluation. So Again, what I'm trying to do is collect 
recommendations from those of you who are on the line and get more information from you. And then also how to improve our user retention. So when people get a training, they're not just walking away and never using IMAP and bases again. Like how do we get our audiences to want to be more involved and stay connected to the program? And so that's something that I'm hoping to collect from all of you. And then also, this is part of my master's research and my project. And so what I will be doing is staying in touch with each and every one of you, working with you over the next couple of years, helping to build this network and being a part of this network. And then also, um, I will likely be collecting an evaluation at the end of how the network worked for you, things that you liked, didn't like, and some other information as well. So your next steps that I'm just asking from each of you on the line, if you are interested in kind of moving forward with this certification, I will be sending an email with the certification plan, then that will be um, within the next hour or so. Unfortunately, it takes about 30 minutes after I close out of the um, Zoom webinar to be able to know who is all on the line exactly and how long um, if they stayed through to the end. And so then also planning your first training session. So it's never too late or never too early to start planning your first training session. I know I have a couple of people who are already planning some for March. And so I'm more than happy to work with all of you to help you get those dates on the line and get things going. And then also, if there's anything else that you're interested in seeing happen from this, um, you know, we are at the beginning stages of this cre creating this project and this this network and so if there's anything else that you think is missing that you know we should to we should do to make this better then we can do that and so just kind of email me reach out to me however you see fit and I will share this PowerPoint so you'll have those two email addresses but then also the numbers to call if you have questions and so with that again I don't know if anybody has any final questions I have seen a couple come in the chat box and so I will follow through those um, now and so if anyone else has questions submit them through the chat box or you can unmute yourself but that is the end of our presentation for the day and so I will be in touch with more information as the as time passes as we get through the creation of this and the, the initial startup and we'll hopefully be working together over the next couple of years to kind of work through all of this so again if you have any questions I'll be on the chat for a little bit and otherwise, I thank you all for joining today and being interested in the IMAP Invasive Certified Trainers Network. So again, thank you and have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. So something that I want to highlight to each of you is this IMAP Invasive Project Guide. And so this is located in the resources section under your references. So it just downloads as a PDF. And this is something that I think that many of you will be interested in checking out.